Hi, I'm Scott. This is Toby, and this is the Roland JD800, a virtual analog synth from 1991. It doesn't work, and we're going to restore it. Coming up next. <laughs> The Roland JD800 is a virtual analog synthesizer produced by Roland from 1991 to 1993. It uses waveforms stored in ROM as its oscillators, and then it features multi-mode filters. Unlike most of the other digital synths at the time, instead of membrane buttons and, and incessant deep menu diving, the JD-800 instead used sliders and, and physical controls that let you have hands-on control over the different sounds. It stores 64 patches internally. You can also store another 64 in external cards, or you can have preset cards that have a read-only 64 patches on them, which this one does have installed. On the back, it has a weird two-prong Roland plug that's compatible with nothing. You can see I have a waveform card installed as well as a data card. So the waveform contains new oscillator waveforms. The data card contains another 64 patches. In, out, through MIDI, you have uh, hold and external control pedals. You have both mix out and direct out audio and a headphone jack. Here's the data card that, control that contains uh, 64 patches on it. These are preset patches that you cannot change. You can also get a battery back card that let you store your own patches, 64 patches on the card. And here's a waveform card that I have installed as well. One of the big problems with the JD800 and other synths from Roland at the same time was this horrible epoxy they used to glue the weights in, in its semi-weighted keyboards. The epoxy glue failed and when any heat occurred, it dripped out and got into the innards of the synthesizer. It was extremely sticky and gooey and it destroyed a lot of synthesizers. Roland actually had a warranty where they would replace keyboards on these synthesizers for free under warranty. However, this one was never actually replaced. As you can see, as a result of the glue dripping down inside the keyboard mechanism, many of the keys are actually glued, stuck, and don't function anymore. This glue often got into the circuitry as well and did a lot of damage. So let's have a look at the synthesizer and see what we can do to restore it. I'm putting a cushion down to protect the pitch bender because I'm gonna, I have to turn it upside down in order to get to the screws on the bottom. As you can see, some of the glue has just gotten everywhere. The whole bottom of this, this synthesizer is actually sticky. I've, I've done a little bit of cleaning with some denatured alcohol, but it's, it's definitely not touched that glue. So uh, there is a, uh, we do need to get that off. So as you can see, there's a whole lot of screws along the back, as well as some screws in the middle, and that will open the clamshell. Once it's open, we can see the circuit boards and wiring inside, and it looks relatively clean. There is a wire that holds it from flipping open all the way. Very nice, Roland. We're going to pull the ribbon cable gently from both sides, disconnect the key bed from the main circuit board. Next, we'll unscrew all the screws holding the key bed in place. There's some on the bottom as well. The key bed is actually glued in place from that red glue as well, so it takes a little bit of work to actually get it to come free. Once we pull it free, you can see all the red glue that's dripped down into the keyboard. Looking at the key bed, it looks in reasonably good shape. There are numbers on every key that indicate 
what position the key is in, so I wrote all those numbers down. Some of the weights have actually fallen out of the keys, and one of them here actually fell and glued itself to the frame of the key bed. You can see the, the sticky mess that's been left behind. At higher room temperatures, that turns into a wet glue. At lower temperatures, it's rock hard. Next, we need to remove the key, bed, the key retainer strips. These strips prevent the keys from being removed from the key bed. The strips are actually held in place with a double-sided tape. We'll need to remove this intermediate board here. This connects the flat cables of the key bed to the ribbon cable that goes to the main circuit board. It also uh, allows the connection of the aftertouch strip. You need to very gently pull these cables straight out from the connectors. And we'll also remove the bracket that was holding that intermediate board. That allows us access to the final retaining strips. You want to try and keep those strips as straight as possible without bending them when removing them. To remove the keys, you actually pull the keys slightly forwards, then pull the back up, and then push it back in towards the back, and then it comes free. Each of the keys has a little spring, a little spring steel, that it gives the key its actual springiness when you press it down. You will need to remove the white keys first before the black keys. You can see the black key also has the glue dripping down and the weight inside. As you can see, I'll push the key forward, push up at the back, and then push back and the key comes free. And this needs to be repeated over and over for every key on the keypad. The black keys, as you can see, because the weights are so farther back, instead of dripping out into the front of the keyboard, has actually dripped all over the felt and the circuit board. I thought, well, this is not gonna be a problem because it's, it's relatively hard in the felt. It's not really sticky. It's not gonna cause an issue. So I thought, I'll just leave it there. Uh, that was a poor decision, as you will see later on in the video. This key here had so much glue drip down, it was actually glued to the rubber strip and the circuit board. I was in danger of actually damaging the circuit board trying to pry it free. So I actually ended up having to cut some of that uh, resin epoxy in order to free the key. What a mess. As you can see, the red glue actually dripped out to the point where the weight was also falling out of the black key. It also got onto both the key press and the key up felt strips. The key press being the ivory ones, which is where the aftertouch strip is located underneath, and the key up strips are the pink ones underneath. And you can see resin in, soaked into both of those. Again, I thought that would not be a problem. It was a problem. If I had to do this over again, I probably would have replaced all the felt on it right, right away from the start. So that's the last key done. Next, we will remove the springs. The springs do have some silicone grease on it that has hardened over the years and it's not really doing much in the way of lubrication anymore. Next, we need to remove the rubber actuator strips. These are extremely delicate, and especially after sitting in the synthesizer since 1991. It's extremely easy to break these little nubs off. My intention was to reuse this strip. I, I later, once I actually cleaned it and got it back together, realized that this strip was not salvageable. Uh, there was just too many keys that weren't functioning. So I actually had to source a replacement for these strips. 
but at this point, I'm still intending to reuse them. As you can see, there's a lot of dust and dirt on those contacts. So that's obviously why a lot of these keys weren't working. So now I've removed the rubber strips. Now, if we look, we see the rubber buffers. These are what allow the keys to not move from side to side, but don't clack on those metal posts. They are all, almost all failed. Some of them are missing. Most of them are, have split and broken, so they're gonna have to be replaced. The parts are definitely not available, so we'll have to figure something out for that. Next, I got five liters of water. I got some protective equipment. I got the mask, face mask, and gloves. And we are mixing up our chemicals here. So we, for five liters of water, we want exactly 250 grams of sodium hydroxide, which is basically drain cleaner. We're gonna pour that into the water. It's gonna make the water very hot because of the chemical reaction as we stir it. So we're gonna stir that up, make sure it's fully stirred, then let it cool down a bit because we don't wanna put the plastic keys into the very hot water. Now that it's cooled off a bit, we're gonna just dump those keys in there. If I had this to do again, I probably would have used more than five liters of water. It's 50 grams of chemical to uh, every liter of water. I probably would have used seven or eight liters. It would have worked better. Five liters was very minimum. Day two. So I let that sit overnight. I stirred it several times during that time just to keep uh, the, the, the solution moving and, and getting into all the different places. You can see it has dissolved almost all that red glue. The, the solution is tinged red from the, the glue that it's dissolved. Keep in mind, you do not want this solution anywhere on your skin or especially on your eyes. It can cause blindness. This is a really noxious chemical, a very dangerous chemical. It smells terrible, that's why I'm doing it in the garage. Um, you definitely don't want this on your skin, and if you get it in your eyes, it, it can cause blindness. So I'm rinsing each of these uh, keys in some soapy water. I've just got water with some detergent in it. And once they've uh, rinsed off inside the detergent for a while, I then use some fresh water to rinse all the detergent off to make sure the keys were completely clean and free of the caustic solution. Some of the keys had uh, the weights still in them, but if you just knocked them on the side of the bucket, the, the weights came right out. Same goes for the black keys. They just need a little persuasion to come out. Here are the keys after they've been washed and rinsed. The weights, you can see they have little nubs on one side and, and indentations on the other. You want the, the nubs going down towards the key. That gives it a little bit of space in between the weight and the key that the, the new glue can get in there to give it a really good bond. I was missing one weight, so I actually cut one myself out of some stock that I had. You can see it there. Here's the black keys and the, how the weights fit into those. I had some uh, epoxy, quick set epoxy on hand, so that's what I used. Uh, if I were to do this again, I probably would have gone and got some just regular epoxy that doesn't set up so quickly. Uh, the reason being, I had to use very small batches of this and just do a few keys at a time because then the epoxy would set up so quickly. So I used a Q-tip to take some of that epoxy, spread it on the inside of the key and then spread it on the key, on the weight on the side where the nubs are projected outwards. And then push it into the key and, and to make sure it's well seated so that the epoxy is, is equally distributed. And then just set it aside and repeat 61 times. Here's the weight that I had to make. It's not the same size as the others, but it's thicker, so the weight of it is exactly the same weight as all the others. As you can see, the epoxy that I was using would set up on my cardboard there, so I'd have to throw it away and then mix up another batch, use it until it started to set up. It was setting up only in about uh, three or four minutes or so, so 
I had to keep mixing, mixing more epoxy to do this. Uh, like I said, next, if I were to do this again, I would have got some, some regular setting epoxy that didn't set up so quickly. The black keys were a little bit tougher because it's much narrower. So I spread the epoxy inside the key as best I could, put the weights inside, and set them aside just like I did with the white keys. You have to be very careful not to get the epoxy on the outside of the keys because uh, it, it's very tough to get off once it is there. You see a couple times where I actually got some on my hands and in, in accidentally put it on the key so I had to wipe it off. And here we are, all the keys are finished. I left them sit like this overnight so that the epoxy had fully cured. Next we gotta deal with these rubber buffers. They're a little bit plastic, maybe silicone. They're, they're slippery and they are all destroyed. So I gotta pull all these off and I'll, tell, I'll show you what I did next to replace those. I had a plan. Some of these were actually glued in place with the red glue. So I ended up having to use a knife to, to really cut away at the epoxy and the rubber to get them off. That should have been an indication that the uh, epoxy on the felt was uh, going to be a problem in the future, but I was still hoping at this point that I was going to be able to get away with leaving the felt the way it was. So here's one of the failed ones where it was actually split. You can see the size. And here's what I'm using as a replacement. I got some silicone hose that is the same outer and inner diameter as the failed pieces. And I'm just gonna cut them to fit about the same size. Just, just eyeballing it, it's not that critical. So there's my replacement, the piece that I just sliced out of that silicone hose. And it seems to be about just about the right size. I sliced up all the ones that I was going to need out of my hose. And then I started fitting them in place. As you can see, it's just about perfect fit. So for a regular key bed, this is gonna be an absolutely ideal fix. I did use some silicone spray to spray on them as well to give them just a little bit extra lubricant. The Deoxit D5 I used on to clean all these uh, carbon contacts, the key switch contacts. And then I also used it to clean the rubber strips. This Deoxit is specifically formulated to help clean carbon contacts like you see in here. So now I started getting ready to put the strips back on so that I could test them. Three weeks later. So then I found out that those strips weren't going to work because I put them all on and they definitely didn't work. So I found a place online that sold replacements in Turkey of all places. Three weeks later, I finally got these strips and I looked at it and I thought, these are not the same. They are definitely not gonna Three. fit. Three weeks later. So I talked to him, he said, oh, sorry, I sent you the wrong one. So three weeks later, again, he sent me the right ones. So now I have brand new strips and to get them to seat in properly, I, I had a little bit of issue I, I, trying to get them to actually go into the holes and seat. So I used a little bit of uh, very fine machine oil and I just put a tiny little bit on the end of each of these little nubs. And that was enough to help lubricate them to get them to slip through the holes without binding up. And it, it made all the difference because it was next to impossible to get them through otherwise. So a little bit of pressure from above, like I'm showing here, and then just grab it and ever so gently with your fingernails, just give it a little pull and a little bit of a wiggle and it just pops right through like that. So just take your time doing this and make sure you don't break any of them. Because you really don't want any of these broken because you want it solid right down against the board so it doesn't let any dust get in there because dust is the enemy of these contacts. 
But once those contacts were on, I tested it again and it worked really well. Next, we got to reinstall the springs. I used some lithium grease. Uh, I know the original used silicone grease. I like lithium grease. It works just as well and it's not going to harden. So there's two different places you need to put it on. One is the place where the spring actually hinges, which is where you can see I'm, I'm putting it on right here. The other is on the end of the spring once it's actually installed. You really want to be careful about this grease. You don't want too much because you don't want it migrating anywhere else. I clean the springs with a solvent. My favorite solvent is just brake cleaner. So I soaked them in brake cleaner and then wiped the old grease off of them. Now it's time to install those springs. The springs are very delicate. The long end goes into where you put the hinge with the, the grease and there's two little legs that center it from side to side. And then the distal end from that hinge just hangs in mid-air like you can see there. Now the, there should be just enough grease to hold the spring in place like you see here. The legs will hold it in place side to side and the grease will hold the end so the spring doesn't fall out. This is actually a very delicate job. Once all the springs were installed, I added grease to the bottom of each spring at the distal end that's suspended in, in midair because that's where the key actually contacts the spring. If you look at the key itself, it has a number on it, 33. I actually wrote all the keys down before I took them off, so I know which order they go in. So we put the key in by hooking the end in, and then we push the end, other end down. Well, that's not working. Hang on, is there something wrong with the spring? No, the spring looks okay, so let's try that again. Maybe I put it in the wrong place? No, nope. okay, hooking on, it's not going on, and can't force it and I suddenly realized what was going on because of the extra epoxy inside the key it was no longer fitting over those rubber bumpers so the rubber bumpers I put on there even though they're the correct size are no longer going to work on this key bed ah oh, crap gotta find a new solution Ugh. so my new solution is plastic dip so I'm going to take off those rubber bumpers and instead, I'm just gonna coat them with a thin coating of Plastidip, which is a silicone rubber, and it, it, it has solvents in it, so it's a liquid, but it dries fairly quickly and cures into a silicone rubber coating. So first, I'm going to cover up the felts to make sure that I don't get any of the Plastidip on there, is do the same thing with the circuit board, and then brush on the Plastidip, which, uh, takes about five minutes to dry to the touch, so I did several coats. I think I did four coats of this on there. Six hours later. Then I sprayed it with some silicone just to give it a little bit extra lubricity. And then just peeled off the masking tape. This actually worked incredibly well. So it, it, it was obviously not uh, the ideal solution, but is a workable solution that ended up working very well. As you can see, the keys fit on very well now. So to fit the keys back on, you hook the far end out on the top of the screen, like you see I'm doing here, you hook that in there, push down on the spring, and then push it forward until it hooks and then let it go back again. You can see, there we go, push it forward and it hooks. So once you get the hang of it, it's actually very quick to do. These keys are, are amazingly easy to take on and put off. So once they're on, I'm then just gonna go through it and test each of the keys and make sure that they all press normally and spring back more importantly. All right, so now we're gonna put back in those blocking strips, the, uh, the strips that hold the keys in that prevent them from being removed from the key bed. The next day. And guess what, it didn't work because it got hot the next day and all the keys started sticking because there was all that epoxy still in the felt. So I started cutting out the felt wherever there was epoxy 
and putting in replacement felt that I hadn't bought. It's an adhesive felt with the adhesive on one side. As you can see, there's, it's, it's really saturated into the felt, and so this is just really unusable. But you have to cut down through that, that felt all the way down to the, the uh, aftertouch strip, but you can't touch the aftertouch strip, so it's, it's very delicate work. I cut that piece of felt out, and then I replace it with the new felt. This was successful. The key bed now works perfectly. Next, we got to get rid of all the glue on the keyboard itself. So I use this air sprayer. This is used for the like, air for cleaning computers. If you turn it upside down, it sprays out liquid, which is not what you're supposed to do. However, it's extremely cold. It's very volatile. It sort of evaporates quickly and gets very cold. And it makes that sticky glue go rock hard. And that means that you can actually scrape it off like you're seeing here. I also used a cleaner called Great Stuff, which I'll put a link to down below, that also got the remnants out after it was finished. Next, we got to look at the switches. So we need to remove all the circuit boards on the front control panel that have switches on them. In fact, we're going to remove all the control boards on the front panel. The control boards have bonding straps between them and the main circuit boards, and they are soldered in place. So in order to remove the, the boards separately, you have to desolder those. So that's, that's not a tough job. Just one wire at a time. And once the wires have been desoldered, We'll take out this uh, support leg here so that we can get the rest of the screws out and remove the first board. To remove the wire from the header, we want to pry up equally on both sides gently. You don't want to yank it by the wires because you can actually end up damaging the wires. You want to pry it up very gently until you can, it comes loose. Next, if we look at the keycaps, they are not actually part of the buttons. They're attached over top of the buttons. So we need to remove those keycaps to access the buttons. And the way that's done is they just have little uh, releases on the back side. So if you just push the two releases together, the keycap will just pop right off and then it reveals the switches underneath. And the same thing goes for all the other keycaps. Anytime I'm doing this kind of disassembly, uh, I will take every sub assembly, like this board for instance, and I will put all the screws and all the parts I've taken off that board into a Ziploc bag, and I will write on the bag with a Sharpie what it's for, and that helps you keep the parts organized. So here I'm taking off the, uh, the left side uh, panel, the, you know, the famous angled panel. You can see the board is angled. And same thing, take its, its uh, keycaps off and put all those parts into their own little baggie. Now these two front panel boards here, uh, I'm not actually going to remove, uh, I'm not gonna disconnect them because the switches on them, there's only a few switches and they're not ones that can be replaced. They're not really available, they're hard to get to. So I'm just gonna pull these down here so that I can clean them, clean the sliders more, most importantly. The left panel has a couple knobs on encoders that have to be removed from the front panel before the, the PC board can actually be removed from the, the lid. Now I'm going to use some of that dust off, the same thing I was using before to remove the glue, just to blow dust out of the faders and all around the boards. There's quite a bit of dust in there. Now I've got some deoxid fader cleaner. This is specifically for this type of fader. Uh, it works on potentiometers and faders. Not only does it clean it, it leaves behind a lubricating layer so that it, the, the faders work really well uh, in the future. So you wanna spray it into each of the faders and then work the faders up and down to make sure it, it spreads that cleaner and lubricant all and up and, up and down inside each of the, the sliders. 
If you have scratchy faders on a mixer, this is the stuff you want to use. All the faders on the volume board and all the other boards also get cleaned. I also cleaned the potentiometers on the uh, pitch bend lever. With those cleaned, we will fasten the two main control circuit boards back into place. I noticed there was two sets of holes and in both the cover and the circuit board, and it didn't seem to matter which ones were used. There are a couple of cases the screws didn't seem to go in well on one of the holes, so I just used the other ones. I'm not quite sure why they would have two sets of holes like that. Maybe there was a production change at some point and that was their way of adapting to having parts that worked with both, I'm not sure. All right, now we get on to the fun part of removing the switches. So we're gonna desolder each of these switches one by one. I, I prefer using this hand-operated desoldering pump where you heat up the, the solder joint and then you trigger the pump and it actually uses applies vacuum and sucks the solder up into it. Uh, generally, this gets most of the solder out and then it's a very simple job to, to loosen the, the component and then just pry it away from the boards. Now, these boards were very thin and very delicate and the traces on them were also very delicate. Just by removing some of these components, uh, it damaged some of the traces on the board, so I didn't have to do some trace repair on some of these. Uh, I, normally, you don't have to do this sort of thing. I'm not quite sure why these boards were so delicate. The traces didn't seem to be adhered to the board very well, and it didn't take any kind of uh, movement at all just to pull them up. For that reason, after I replaced all of the switches on these boards, uh, I actually did continuity tests on all of them to make sure that none of the traces were damaged and that all the switches were operating normally. You gotta make sure that the switches are fully pressed into the board and fully seated flat against the board uh, when they are soldered in, because if they're lifted up too far, you could actually end up with problems having them actuated when they're not supposed to be actuated. We clip off the leads. And you can see here's the old switch that I removed. And there is the new one that I just installed. So that is the first switch of 52. So now repeat that process 52 more times on all the different circuit boards. This took a long time, as you would imagine. I, I got to boards like this where there's a whole lot of switches. I would install the switches, bend the leads out to hold them in place rather than doing them one at a time. So I would get all these switches installed in place and then they're held in place by having those leads bent out. Then I would solder them all at once. And I would solder one lead and then push the switch in, reheat that solder joint and make sure the switch was fully seated against it. And then I would do the second lead. You can see me pushing against the switches there to, to reheat the joints and, and make sure the switches were pressed solid against the board. So now with all the new switches in place, we're going to reinstall the keycaps and they just snap in place. It just takes two seconds. You just position them where they're supposed to go, give it a little gentle pressure and a little bit of a rocking motion and it snaps right on in place. No problem at all. We connect the wires back up and screw them back into place. The keycaps are very brittle and delicate plastic, so just be careful when you're reinstalling them because it would be very easy to break one of those. Now we gotta re-solder those ground wires. And now we're gonna do a modification to the power supply. So first we need to remove the power supply, so we're gonna gen gently remove these headers, or the, the connectors from the headers. And then there's four screws holding the power supply in on the top. There is two more screws on the bottom that hold the transformer directly to the case because the transformer is fairly heavy and there's nuts on the top. 
and then you can see I've loosened the transformer and now there's one more screw in the bottom that holds the power supply in place. So now we've removed that and the power supply should be free to remove, which it is. So what we're gonna do is replace this weird Roland socket with a standard IEC socket. There's the weird two lead one and there's the replacement IEC we're gonna put in. Make sure it fits properly, which it does. The problem is that the Roland one, where are you gonna find that plug if you break it or if it goes missing? Whereas the IEC ones are standard and everywhere has those, so. Plus the Roland one's not grounded. So because it's not, we're now gonna have a ground that the Roland one didn't have originally, we need to create a ground lead. So I crimped a ring terminal on there and we're going to connect it to the ground terminal on the IEC socket. And we'll solder that in place. This is not exactly the type of soldering this, this uh, temperature controlled iron is meant to do. So it takes a while to heat up the joint enough to get the solder to flow properly. This is more meant for very small electronic soldering. So we'll get that in there. Well, once we've installed the actual uh, socket, we will connect up the wires. The terminals are actually marked on there. You'll see there will be a neutral and a line. Obviously the black is the line and that's the one that is switched and the white is the neutral. So just make sure you get those correct. And we'll solder those in place as well. Once we've soldered those in place, we'll just slide the heat shrink tubing back over top of them to give us some insulation. Now to connect the ground, I'm actually going to connect it to the frame of the power supply. And I don't want to use just the screw, so I don't want to put it on top of that board because that means the screw, we're depending on the screw to carry the ground. If we put the ring terminal underneath, it's actually physically against the metal frame of the power supply. And that's a much better ground than, than expecting it to, to go through the screw. So we'll have a nice metal on metal contact from that ring terminal to the ground of the power supply case. So we'll get that good and tight so we have a, a positive ground. And we will throw away this old useless rolling thing. And there's our new socket. So fitting it back in, you actually have to tip it up at the front to get it. I had to figure that out the hard way to get it underneath the screws of the hinge at the back. So you'll see, I'll figure that out here. There, tip it up and then it just slides into place. Just give it a little bit of a wiggle and there it goes. Now we'll install the screws holding it on top, install the screws holding down the transformer and the nuts on top, and reinstall our in, uh, connectors and the headers. I also did an aftertouch modification here. The modification consists of a 270 kilo ohm resistor that's soldered in parallel with R27. You'll have to do some very fine soldering on surface mount components, so if you're not comfortable with this, I'd not suggest that you attempt it. What it does is make the aftertouch more sensitive so you don't have to press just so much, so hard on the keyboard to actuate it. Next, we're gonna check the uh, DAC linearity. This is in the service manual. It checks to make sure that the DAC BIOS is correct. Uh, the, the procedures actually do this is specified in the service manual. I checked mine, I was ready to adjust it, but it was already perfect, so I had nothing to do once I, I checked the, the output on the scope. One last thing I needed to do was change the battery. I don't know how old the battery was in this thing, but I figured I'll just put a new one in just to be sure. So there's my new one, just a standard CR2032 battery. All right, so now I'm gonna screw in the key bed and it's not quite lined up right, so I'll loosen it, reposition it, tighten it again. And now I'm gonna reassemble the whole thing and screw all the screws in place to, to close the clamshell case together. And here it is, it's working. Everything is like new. The aftertouch is more sensitive than it was from the factory. All the sliders work great. All the keys work great. None of them stick. They're all equal velocity. 
the pitch bender works, all the buttons work. This is a fantastic synthesizer, so let's just give it a listen for a bit.